Chronic pain is a complex biopsychosocial phenomenon that impacts over 30% of people globally. Pain cuts across all medical specialties, and it is linked to the opioid crisis. The Lancet Pain Series is a three-part comprehensive update on best practices, controversial topics, and new advances in pain medicine. I'm Dr. Shravni Durbakula, pain medicine faculty at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. A warm welcome to our authors, Dr. Stephen Cohen, Mike Hooten, Marianne Fitzcharles, Ulan Sivanesan, Clement Hamani, and Helena Knutkova. Dr. Cohen, you are the curator of this series. What were your goals in creating it? We embarked on this series because pain pervades nearly all aspects of human existence, from birth to death. It's the most common reason people seek health care and the leading cause of disability in the world. The treatment of pain has been described as a fundamental human right, but many people are denied this right, and access to pain care does not equate with successful pain treatment. Tell us about these three different articles. The first article in the series represents an overview of new advances in pain care, from recent changes in the definition of pain, the classification of pain, and recognition of the ubiquitous, deleterious effects poorly managed chronic pain can have on our lives. These include, but are not limited to, functional and anatomical changes in our body, such as loss of gray matter in the brain, a growing recognition that even controlling for higher rates of suicide and opioid addiction, chronic pain is associated with an increased risk of developing multiple diseases and a shorter life expectancy, and a push towards personalized medicine because indiscriminately prescribing medications and performing procedures based on a person's diagnosis or symptoms will lead to escalating healthcare costs, which often bear little relationship to pain prevalence or disability rates and unnecessarily increase the risk-benefit ratio of therapy. The second article is on the new pain category called nosoplastic pain, in which the major mechanisms involve sensitization of one's nervous system. This category includes conditions formerly called functional pain syndromes, such as the prototypical disorder, fibromyalgia, and they require a different treatment paradigm. The last article in the series is on neuromodulation. Neuromodulation represents one of the most rapidly growing areas, not just in pain, but in all of medicine, and includes surgical modalities, such as deep brain and spinal cord stimulation, and non-invasive therapies, such as transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS, and repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS. How does one differentiate pain types based on etiology and mechanism? Pain can be classified mechanistically, which is challenging in clinical practice, by severity and by acuity. This is important because it affects treatment decisions at all levels of care. Mechanistically, pain can be classified as nociceptive, which is pain that results from activity in neural pathways secondary to tissue damage or potential tissue damage. This includes most forms of acute pain and arthritis. Neuropathic pain is defined as pain that stems from disease or injury that affects the somatosensory system and may be associated with greater decrements in quality of life than nociceptive pain. Common examples include diabetic neuropathy, carpal tunnel syndrome, and pain that persists after a stroke. Nosoplastic pain is the newest category of pain, and it's defined as pain arising from the abnormal processing of pain signals without clear evidence of tissue damage or pathology involving the somatosensory system. There are no biomarkers that can diagnose nosoplastic pain, and treatment can be challenging. Frequently, Pain conditions contain components of more than one category. What is the difference between acute pain and chronic pain? And when does one become the other on the continuum? Acuity is important because it's a major determinant of prognosis. The longer a person has pain, the more difficult it is to treat because of the changes that ensue in the nervous system. Acute pain confers evolutionary survival value while chronic pain is often viewed in both biomedical and biopsychosocial models as a disease by itself. Previously, there were several different definitions of chronic pain. Pain lasting longer than three months, lasting longer than six months, or pain lasting longer than the expected duration of healing, which is inherently subjective. Recently, 
the International Association for the Study of Pain and the World Health Organization find that it is pain lasting longer than three months. However, there is no clear-cut threshold as to when acute pain becomes pathologic. Dr. Cohen, any final thoughts? Yes. If you have any additional questions after reading this series, feel free to contact me or any of the other authors. Dr. Hooten, pain is not like an infected appendix that can simply be cut out with a scalpel, or like an infection that we can treat with antibiotics and fluid. Tell us about the challenges that are unique to the evaluation and treatment of pain states. Chronic pain is challenging to treat because so many factors need to be considered. For example, there are individual factors, including age, sex, gender, ethnic differences, cultural differences. There are also individual factors related to the individual's history. For example, a family history of mental health problems, a family history of substance use, and even a personal history of substance use should be considered and are important when thinking about overall treatment. Of course, during the course of chronic pain, uh, bi-directional problems might arise. So for example, it's very common for depressive symptoms to emerge, anxiety-related symptoms, and these are important because they not only affect pain intensity, but they also will affect the individual's overall functioning. So as we think about treatments for chronic pain, we must consider all of these factors in the context of the biopsychosocial model. With that said, what advances are needed to make treatments more reliable? There is many areas of ongoing research needed, but one of the most critical areas and one that is just in its infancy is really understanding how personal factors impact the precision of targeted pain treatments. For example, whether the treatment is an interventional treatment, a non-pharmacological intervention, or a non-opioid-based outcome that we're searching for, these individual factors could affect how the individual may benefit from those interventions. Dr. Fitzcharles, please elaborate on the diagnosis of nosoplastic pain. Nosoplastic pain diagnosis is based on a history of the pain complaint by the patient and the presence of commonly associated central features such as fatigue, sleep disturbance, cognitive difficulties, amongst others. The physical examination is generally within normal limits, and there are unfortunately no measurable biomarkers to confirm the diagnosis. Nosoplastic pain is at least partly reversible. How can we effectively treat it? Well, the ideal treatment is a multimodal approach, beginning with non-pharmacologic measures, we must acknowledge that the subjective symptoms are real. We should provide education that the pain is due to a sensitization of the nervous system and advise patients to follow good health-related lifestyle practices. Selected medications can be used, but they can be expected to give mostly a modest effect at best. Could you specify what some of those medications might be? Well, we really can consider medications such as the pain modulators, the gabapentinoids, some of the antidepressants. And the most important thing is to keep away from opioid medications. Dr. Sivanesan, what is neuromodulation? Neuromodulation is an exciting field of medicine involving technology that can be non-invasive, minimally invasive, or surgical in their implantation techniques to place devices along the nervous system to alter neural activity. This neural activity has often become aberrant or hypersensitized in multiple different types of pain conditions. Which types of pain is neuromodulation most applicable for? It's most often used in neuropathic pain conditions, such as complex regional pain syndrome or failed back surgery syndrome. It can possibly be used in a new term for pain called nosoplastic pain, particularly in those patients who have failed oral pain medications, injections, physical therapy, and more conservative methods. Dr. Hamani, tell us about invasive brain stimulation. Invasive brain stimulation consists of the delivery of electrical stimulation 
either to deep brain tissues uh, and a technique called deep brain stimulation or to the surface of the brain in a technique called cortical stimulation or motor cortex stimulation. Is there literature supporting invasive brain stimulation for the treatment of pain? There certainly is. Uh, in, in initial studies with uh, uh, a so-called open label design in which patients knew they were receiving stimulation and investigators also knew the patients were receiving stimulation, they show very substantial analgesic effects of uh, these therapies. Uh, more recent blinded studies in which neither the patients nor the investigators knew they were receiving stimulation were uh, not that uh, the, the pain effect was not that substantial. In other words, active stimulation did not uh, differentiate itself from sham stimulation substantial amount. Given these mixed results from existing studies, what further research is required? What we notice over the years is that uh, there's a proportion of patients that certainly respond to brain stimulation with uh, in either open or blinded studies. What we need to know is to characterize who these patients are before the procedures. In other words, we need what's called biomarkers of a treatment response. We need, for example, neuroimaging studies or electrophysiological studies or clinical studies that uh, allow us to, before the operations, know and be able to tell who's going to respond to the procedure and who's not going to respond to the procedure. Dr. Natkova, how does non-invasive stimulation fit into our treatment algorithms? Non-invasive neuromodulation involves a set of methods that apply a stimulus on the surface of the skin so these techniques do not require a surgical procedure. Non-invasive stimulation can be directed either to peripheral nerves or to neural circuits in the brain. In the past decades, many techniques have been developed and tested. The evidence on analgesic efficacy is growing and so is the interest of medical professionals and patients in this novel approach. As it doesn't require surgery, non-invasive neuromodulation can be considered to support symptom management earlier in the continuum of care. There are some disadvantages and they include the requirement for multiple sessions as well as heterogeneity of stimulation protocols. Thank you, Dr. Natkova. And thank you to all of our authors who have contributed immensely to the Lancet Pain Series. This series is of value to colleagues from all medical specialties and to anyone who is looking to learn more about chronic pain medicine, diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment.